All right, good afternoon, good morning. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another Together at Home webcast. My name is Matt Vance. I'm the Woodwind Product Specialist for Buffet Crampon USA. Welcome, and welcome to our esteemed special guest who is recently retired, actually. And as you have probably figured out, he's not in Chicago anymore. Uh, please welcome to our uh, to this afternoon's webcast, the legendary bass clarinetist of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, Lori Bloom. Lori, how are you? I'm well. Hello to everybody. It, it looks like you're uh, you're comfortable in your new surroundings. You wanna you wanna tell us a little bit about uh, where you are and what you're doing? Uh, I I now as of what is today as of three days ago, I live in Bend, Oregon, which is in central Oregon. And as you can see, it's a beautiful sunny day as it has been every day since we've gotten here. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, so how did, how did you and, and Nan choose Bend, Oregon? I mean, it's obviously a beautiful location, but, but what, what drew you over there from, uh, from Chicago? You know, uh, Chicago is a great, in incredible city for us to make, a, you know, make our life in. Uh, my wife is a theater costume designer, and of course, I played in the orchestra for for forty years and with the opera company for a couple of seasons before that. It was a great place, but both of us love to, to hike and to ski and to bike and everything outdoors, and. Uh, I, the absolute first impetus was the fact that our kids both live on the West Coast now. Uh, they don't happen to live in Bend or even currently in Oregon, but uh, but at least we're in the same time zone. <laughs> uh, so that was that was what started us looking on the West Coast. I had played in the Vancouver Symphony years ago, so I knew the Pacific Northwest was was a very attractive area for the kinds of things we wanted to do. And in looking and visiting in the last five years of my, my son used to live in Portland and then he brought us to Bend for the first time. And, you know, we, it has everything we wanted and, and isn't in the rainy part of Oregon. So well, yeah, wife, you, mentioned, you mentioned you've had sun, uh, sunshine since you got out there, right? Absolutely. They, they claim they have 300 or more days a year of sun. Oh, wow. So my wife grew up in Arizona. I'm, I'm just bringing her kind of home yeah. to, a, to a better place. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. And congratulations to you on, on getting out there safely, number one, especially in, in these times. Yeah. Um, well, let, let's talk a little bit, um, and if you're just joining us, uh, welcome. We've got Lori Bloom joining us on our Together at Home webcast this afternoon. Uh, he is joining us live from Bend, Oregon. Uh, my name is Matt Vance. I'm the Woodwind Product Specialist. Uh, I'm joining you from Buffet Crampon USA headquarters in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to have Lori on today. It's great to have you, the viewers, joining us as well. Uh, you can see in the comments section, uh, that we are inviting questions for our special guest today. So if you have a question you would like to ask Lori about his career, about his equipment, which we'll get into in a few minutes, um, anything uh, that you'd like to know about Lori Bloom, please uh, put it in the, uh, in the comments section. We've already got some uh, people chiming in, Lori. Donnie Todd is uh, saying hello from South Carolina. He's our Southeast Division Manager. Of course, Lori Orr from our New York showroom also says, Hello, and sends her best wishes to you as well. Uh, Grace Johnson says hello from Northern Indiana, and Declan Lynch is also saying hello from an office just down the hallway, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Good um, morning, everybody. Yeah, so it, it's great having you with us. Um, what I'd like to, to get into now was actually the last time I saw you. Uh, it was in February. And it was, and I, I have to tell you, I'm so thankful that you were able to get this world premiere solo performance of Ophelia's Tears in 
with the CSO before everything shut down. Um, I've actually got, I don't know if you can see that or not. There's a nice picture from down in the green room after your performance with uh, our president and CEO, Francois Clock. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been an interesting time for you since then with your retirement from the CS, uh, CSO. Could you talk a little bit about the experience of doing the, the world premiere performance and then kind of what happened with the CSO after that? Sure. Um, for those who don't know, Nicolas Bacri uh, was commissioned by Ricardo Muti and the CSO to write me a concerto. Um, he was hesitant to do that, not because of me, but because he didn't think the bass clarinet could, could be the solo protagonist. Uh, I, w I actually, we gave, I should start, but we gave scores to Ricardo Muti from five different composers. Uh, he, he liked two of them and said, pick the one you want. And Nicolas Bacri from Paris was my first choice all along. So I said, sure, let's get him. I have played chamber music of Nicholas's, but I'd, but I'd never met him. So I flew to Paris in February of 19 to meet with him and play for him. And I had never, I'd never actually voiced that I didn't want him to start writing until we'd met, but he had not started writing. He had done his homework. He'd gone to Belgium uh, for the base, well, he lives in Brussels, but he went to was was in the uh, ICA that year in in Ostend, Bel Belgium, mm -hmm. and he went and listened to a lot of bass clarinet, uh, and and then I went and I played for him, and I just, I just started pl I played for him a piece called uh, Ophelia, which is a solo clarinet piece he had written, and he had based that on a piece that he wrote uh, for clarinet and soprano. And uh, I, I played it on bass clarinet, which he didn't think was possible. Um, so it, it, one of the things that came out of that meeting is he changed the dedication on the piece or he added me to it and said it's pu and published it for clarinet or bass clarinet. And after playing many excerpts from orchestral works and talking about the what I thought were the strengths and weaknesses in terms of standing in front of an orchestra with a bass clarinet, um, you know, we we had a cup of tea and he went his way and I went mine, and fairly quickly I started getting like a page or two of pencil written. Uh, what do, you, what do you think about this? And then and then another, can you play this? And, and it wasn't incredibly technically difficult in terms of speed. It was something that was very high and very soft. Hmm. And so I would play through things and say, yeah, I can do that. And so ultimately I didn't really ask for, for any major changes. I, they were all little things like can, that, that diminuendo should start a bar later if you expect to hear me <laughs> and you know, things like that. But I, everything, the way he'd written it, he's written extensively for the clarinet, uh, particularly for American players. If you don't know Nicholas Bakri, look into his, look at his website. He's written enormous amount of chamber music, including the clarinet. So he knows, and he's a great composer. I mean, he knows what he's doing. And, uh, so in February we got the, you know, we performed the piece, and and I have to say, your colleagues are usually your your harshest critics, not necessarily against you personally, but against whatever piece you picked. If you play the bass clarinet, you play new music. I mean that's the reality, and obviously a commission is going to be not only brand new, but you have no idea, as as my good friend Augusta Reed Thomas says. It's, it's a complete act of faith. You have no idea what you're going to get. And 
Muti started the rehearsals off by saying to the orchestra, I want to introduce you to Nicholas Bakri. He's written us a very good piece. And I'm sure there were members of the orchestra that didn't like it, but they didn't talk to me. And many, many said, wow, this is a terrific piece. So I think it's, it's added an enormous step forward, in my opinion, to solo bass clarinet repertoire with orchestra. And I'm sure it's going to get played a lot. Uh, I already know in, in Europe it's already being planned. So, so that, that took place at the end of February. The last performance was the 23rd of February. I just happened to have a couple of weeks there next with rotation. So I, I actually flew to California to see my son and his wife for a week, got back, played three rehearsals with the orchestra, went home Thursday afternoon after rehearsal and, and later in the afternoon got an email said to the whole orchestra saying, don't come back. So the concerto was the last thing I ever played with the CSO. Your last public performance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Um, and so they, like many organizations, having no idea what exactly we were up against, they, they canceled you know, from March to April 9th. And then about April 8th, they told us, no, we're going to be off till May 10th. And then May 10th till June 9th. And ultimately, the entire downtown season was lost. And, and Ravinia had already shut down mm. the summer season. So that uh, here it was you are. an odd leave. Uh, but as many of you may have seen, uh, they, they made up a rather nice video montage that's available all over. Uh, what you didn't see was the first two thirds of that where Paul Phillips and I, all our, we were the two retirees this year and our colleagues made video remarks, you know, recordings, whatever they wanted to do. And we got those. I don't. I don't think those were made public. Yeah, I, I don't think I saw those. I did see the the one, the montage of all the photos and everything flying well, by. <laughs> they yeah. do go by quickly. Yeah, I had to hit the pause button quite a bit, and and I'm I'm delighted to see the return of the mustache. Actually, that's a, that's a good look for you. <laughs> hey, um, I'm I'm glad you brought that up because with your retirement from the orchestra and, and your colleague, um, you received the Theodore Thomas medallion for, or you will receive the Theodore Thomas medallion for distinguished service. So could you talk a little about that? That's, that's a standard uh, award to members who, as they retire. Um, when that's gonna happen, we have no idea at this point. Uh, that would have happened in June uh, at one of the you know, one of Muti's concerts, um, they would have they would have done that. Uh, that obviously got short circuited, but they're already saying you know, well once we're back playing, we'll find a concert you want to come in on and, and play something if you want. <laughs> yeah. That was going to be my next question. Are you going to play? Or are you going to? Uh... Well, I, th I think so. There's several things, you know, what you don't know at this point, what none of us can know is, is when will the orchestra start? I, I think right now it seems the odds are against them starting in September. Uh, it just, we're hearing from more and more orchestras they're canceling through the beginning of 2021, um, which, I, which means the schedule will get changed. So one of the things that, that Steve Williamson and I already talked about was coming back to play Rampartita, uh, play Bassinhorn. And, you know, that, and Muti's conducting that. that would, I'd, I'd love to do that, but you know, I'm sure things will get shuffled around uh, because we were in the middle of a, a celebration like most orchestras of the 250th anniversary of Beethoven. And Muti was scheduled to do the, all nine symphonies 
and I'm sure he's going to want to reschedule those and do them. So things will get bounced around. Um, right of Spring and Prokofiev Five are both on next season. They're well, this may surprise those who don't play bass clarinet enormously that Prokofiev Five is the best bass clarinet part ever written, not Right of Spring. <laughs> <laughs> Red Springs on every audition, but Prokofiev Five. John and John and I have played almost every part in the, in the orchestra in that piece, and we all and we both agree bass is the best part. <laughs> yeah, and both it and Rite of Spring are on the schedule for next year. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you know that I, I was if I'm feel I'm playing enough. I mean, it's a pretty damn good orchestra. You don't just show up and say, well, I haven't practiced for six months, but I think I'm good enough. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we'll see how how I'm feeling about that. I, Ride of Spring was actually the first thing I ever played with the Chicago Symphony. So I think it'd be kind of fun if it was the last thing I ever played with the Chicago Symphony. That would be a nice bookend, wouldn't it? Uh, but Prokofiev currently is scheduled the week after. So we'll see. Okay, okay. Um, uh, welcome to everyone that's joining us this afternoon. Um, as you might have figured out, we are with our very special guest, Lori Bloom, just recently retired from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra as solo bass clarinet. Um, we've got a lot of people that have chimed in in the comments section that would like to say hello to you. Uh, the mm -hmm. first is uh, my wife who says hi. Maggie is chiming in from uh, St. John's, Florida. Um, uh, Tiago Taveras has a, has a question for you, which we'll get to in just a minute, but we'd like to thank him for joining us. Um, Ixie Chin sends her greetings from Cincinnati. So hello to you, Ixie, and thanks for joining Ixie. us. This afternoon. Um, Chris Coppinger is joining us from Long Island. Hey, Chris. Where he's, uh, he took time out of his busy golf schedule to, uh, to say hello <laughs> to you. <friend. laughs> um, Let's see, and we already told you about Donnie Todd. Chris, the weather for golf is much better out here. Yeah, it looks like it. So um, let's see, uh, David Gould is uh, saying hello to the fine sirs. I'm not sure who he's talking about, plural. I know he's talking about you, but. but no, uh, oh, I know David, it couldn't be me. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you for tuning in this afternoon. And Chris McDonald also says hello this afternoon. So. Um, we do have some questions from our viewers and I will get to those, I promise. Um, I did want to talk a little bit more. Uh, you alluded to this when you said the first piece that you played with the CSO was Rite of Spring. Um, I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about your appointment to the CSO, which was in 1980, I believe. And uh, it, was, it was, I think it's a great story. Could you talk a little bit about that for our viewers? Um, okay. I mean, I took, the audition was October, I think, of 79. Uh, and I was playing with the Cincinnati Symphony at that point. And uh, I, I, I think I did have to play prelims I, at that uh, time. They, uh, I had been a finalist. No, I guess I hadn't. They, um, the audition, the part, I, I don't really remember the prelims. You just sort of play prelims and, and you know, but the, the finals, uh, I had never met Sir George Schulte or heard him speak. And I walked out on stage and the very first thing he did was say, I'll do you. And I, I, you know, jumped back a couple of feet and, and he said it again. And I looked what, at What's the, the translation of that, by the way? I looked at the proctor and said, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, how old are you? <laughs> Which I think was an illegal question even then. But, but uh, you know, we got past that and I, uh, there were originally there had been eight finalists, I believe, and 
Schulte, as he often did, said, uh, you hold sort of a semi-final. I don't want to hear all eight. <laughs> and so they did, and it went and it went down to three of us. And so three of us were playing for Schulte. Schulte didn't didn't actually conduct a lot of the repertoire that's that's kind of, I mean, William Schumann Third Symphony is on every bass clarinet at audition. And I'm not sure William that Schulte had ever heard of William Schumann. <laughs> and uh, so he, so he, uh, we had an extensive round. I remember playing about 45 minutes just clarinet round. Um, and then I, I also didn't own a low C bass clarinet yet. That's right. And I, and if we were playing Susco at six. And I had to leave out one. There's a, there's a the big solo of those who play bass. When and I was going, it goes, play it again. Play it again. And I didn't find out till later. I talked to Larry Combs and Schulte leaned over to him and said, what's wrong? And, and Larry said, he doesn't have his low C clarinet. He's leaving out one note. And Schulte said, oh, fine. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, we played, all three of us played an enormous amount of, of music, as I remember. Uh, and ultimately, you know, they said, you got it. You guys can go. And Schulte called me in and talked to me at that point and, uh, and actually wanted me to come play a piece with the CSO that has the Tasso by Liszt has a big bass solo. But I knew Cincinnati was on tour at that point and then wouldn't be able to. And, but he, you know, he said, you've got the job. I mean, if you, you know, if you could come play this great, if you can't, you've still got the job. So. So, I, I mean, it was, you know, anybody who's been through auditions knows they're nerve wracking, but uh, somehow it worked. And so then you joined the CSO in the fall of 1980. That was your first full-time season, correct? Right, right. The right of spring I played was while I was still with Cincinnati, because he asked, can you come up and play right of spring and we're going to Carnegie Hall with it. And it just happened to work with the Cincinnati schedule and they were very generous, said, yeah, go ahead, do it. And uh, that was that was an amazing experience. I, I played Rite of Spring in other orchestras, but not like that. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> and I, I always say it was a little bit like riding on a steamroller. You know, it feels like nothing could go wrong. All you had to do is put your part in because everything else was there. Yeah. So it was, it was, and, and Schulte's right was very angular and angry. He did not go for prettying it up. Uh, it was, it was fantastic. And, and in 1980, there were many, many members of the orchestra who had actually played a lot for Stravinsky. And so in talking to them, they all said, Stravinsky constantly said, play what you see on the page, don't change it. So he didn't, he didn't want this, you know, you hear versions of Rite of Spring where they try to make it really pretty and beautiful and, and it loses some of the anger uh, in the, in, you know, those parts. So. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something uh, earlier regarding your audition for, uh, for Schulte about not having a low C bass clarinet. Um, I assume you got one once you, once you got in the CSO. And, and I know it was a little while before you actually started playing a buffet bla uh, bass clarinet. Is that, is that correct? That's true. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I got a, I borrowed a, a low C summer that, that was a prototype and they shipped it to me to arrive the day of the first rehearsal of Shostakovich 7. And they had changed the key pattern. Oh, no. 
and I never played I never played that solo correctly in any rehearsal, and I never screwed it up in any concert. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, I think Slatkin was conducting. You must have wondered, am I ever going to hear this right? <laughs> so um, no, it was ninety two when when. One of our clarinetists went to Montleville to, uh, to have some work done at the factory and went on tour. And when they got to the bass clarinet assembly room, uh, I don't I don't know if it was Philippe Lecon uh, or if this predates Philippe, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't remember. But uh, they said, ask Greg, you know, what bass clarinet does your bass, bass clarinetist play? said, well, he plays Selmer. And they put one in a box and said, can you take, I mean, in a case, and said, can you take this to him and let him try it? And I actually played half a concert on it that night. And I was in Montleville the next day and tried everything they had and, and bought my first buffet bass. So. And that was, the, that was the prestige. That was when they changed over to the prestige design, right? I don't even think it was called the Prestige, was it? I'm not sure. It was the one that René Lezo designed. Okay. Which, which was a huge step forward. It was it was much much better than than what Buffet had been making, and I liked it better than than my summer, and I had a very good summer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then of course in '98 uh, came the came the first what I the first eleven ninety three. Uh, and it's you know, and then and then the Tosca. So it's been a fantastic progression within my career. Yeah, which you and you've had input into some of those designs as well. I remember years ago, I think you'd gotten your hands on on a Tosca prototype one time when you were touring when the CSO was touring in Europe. And I remember you immediately contacted me and started asking me when we were going to get some in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, it was like five years before they were made. Right. <laughs> and I totally freaked out Greg. And and uh, I think it would have been Antoine in those days because they they brought it down to Paris. So I could so I could before the concert, Greg, d d I can't pronounce his last name. <laughs> oh, Gregory Demayer. Yes. Demayer. Yeah. He brought it down an hour and a half before the concert so we could play it on stage when it was quiet. And it, and it, I was very impressed. And I said, okay, I'm going to play it tonight. And he looked terrified. <laughs> this was a prototype. He didn't know if like, all the keys might fall off or something. <laughs> and I was playing, there was a contemporary piece. I don't remember what it was, but it had a big bass solo. So I played the thing. And, and, Many colleagues in the woodwinds said, is that a different bass? I, I was like amazed. And, and I said, yeah, I have to give it back though. <laughs> <laughs> well, now let, let's talk a little bit about that because you, you played prestige for years and years and you continue to play prestige. If I, if I recall, you played your prestige in February, right? I did, I did. Yeah, so maybe if you could talk a little bit about when you switched from the prestige to the Tosca, what what drew you to that particular instrument? And and maybe for you, what some of the differences are, the qualities that you like about each one, and maybe mm -hmm. the circumstances that you would use one over the other, like the example we used the, the prestige yeah. or the Tosca. Yeah, technically I never switched to the Tosca because I've kept both of them and I play both of them. Mm -hmm. um, they are different. There's no question. The the bore of the Tosca is slightly smaller. Uh, at least that's what Eric told me. <laughs> I haven't measured it. Um, I take his word for it. Uh, the intonation is a little bit different. Uh, so you do have to be aware which one you have in your hand because, uh, I mean, for me, I've been playing the 1193 so long that it, that it's absolutely normal. Where, what I'm going to do with certain notes. It's just second, totally second nature. Uh, the Tosca, I would, I would actually say 
right out of the box for for somebody who's not been playing a prestige a lot the the tusca scale is easier to work with mm. it's very very good um i also think for doublers who do not play as much bass as, as most of us who are in a bass position, it's an easier switch back and forth from clarinet to bass clarinet. Mm. Uh, be because the bore is a little smaller, it, it's, you know, you, you've got to know what you're doing to drive the prestige. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, and it, it is a different sound, you're right. It is a different sound. It's a, it, it has a, a lot of core when i play you know it's funny part of it for me is just the feel uh when i play them on stage like at orchestra hall alone i could go i could play this one and i played them for for our recording engineer i played them, i was playing in one of our cellists is a friend of mine and they all kept picking one but i would you know but i'd be and then and then they'd say yeah but they both sound great. You know, and Steve Williamson was like, I don't know which one you're playing when you play it. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they feel different. They feel a little different. Uh, like Tosca clarinets, the Tosca bass, the scale just feels so smooth from top to bottom. It, you know, it's so easy to match notes. You, you don't have to work quite as hard. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I, I, it becomes to me just personal preference. They're, they're two extraordinary bass clarinets and, and it's which one works for you. Uh, and you felt like the prestige worked a little bit better for Ophelia's Tears. I felt that I could, could more comfortably generate more sound which up in front of the orchestra was an important aspect. Uh, but, uh, but other than that, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't feel strongly, oh, this, this is, you know, it, it, I find, I find my prestige is a slightly more colorful sound than my Tosca. Okay. But, yeah, I also, I remember the day I picked my prestige. Uh, um, in those days, Buffet was still in Illinois. And I went into the Wenger room, was trying all these, and Francois walked by and I caught, I said, come here. And he came in and I said, this is the bass I've been playing. And I already had an 1193. I said, I've been playing this for a year. And I played it and he went, and I said, this is one I just picked out and I played it and he went, <laughs> and, and I took it home and played the Shostakovich uh, Lady Macbeth of Minsk. And, and Larry and Greg both went, what is that thing, a cannon? <laughs> I mean, it, it's, a, it's an exceptional bass clarinet. Yeah. So. And that's the one that you played in February. It is. You know, and, you know, is that, because I'm so used to it, or I mean, I they're they're both they're both wonderful, and and I could easily play the Tusca full time, but I I like them both. So oh, oh, that's great. Um, I do want to get to some of the questions from some of our viewers. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. If you're just tuning in, we have uh, the legendary Lori Bloom recently retired from the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. He's joining us today on our Together at Home webcast. Obviously, he is not in Chicago anymore. He is in Oregon, where he has just recently relocated. Uh, Tiago Taveras, uh, we uh, said hello to him earlier. He has a question for you. He says, what do you think, um, let's see, I'm going to try and, and he's, he's asking, what do you think projects more, a focus sound with timbre or more clear or a big dark sound with a more open mouthpiece? I hope I'm relaying that question properly. I'm, uh, yeah, that's a tricky one to, 
I, I don't use exactly those words, and that's the problem with all of us talking about sound is how to describe it. Mm. For me, I'm looking for the most complexity I can get. And yeah. by that, I mean a combination of highs and lows. You know, I, to me, on a particularly on a bass clarinet, a really dark sound is, is worthless in an orchestra because you won't be heard. Mm -hmm. A really bright, buzzy sound is ugly. I'm looking for something that has incredible complexity that I, that I can get, the, that it has enough highs to really cut, it has enough lows to really pump up the, you know, to feel like I'm really you know, able to fill the sound with, with colors. And, and if I have that, then I'm able to make choices musically. Uh, but sure. but for me, I want I want an instrument that and I I went through this when I picked my Tosca, which I picked at the factory in Montreal, and Eric came in, the designer. For those who I'm throwing names around, and maybe yeah. some of you don't happen to know, Eric Gray. Eric Gray, yeah. Designed the the bass clarinet, and and I had gotten out of all that I had that day, I'd gotten down to two, and he was picking one. And I was like, no, it's this one. And he stood there. And of course, Eric's a wonderful clarinetist himself. And he stood there listening. And it took him and he, it took him a while. And then he went, no, you're right. That's the one. Uh, but, you know, sound is very individual. And you're, you know, you've got to get, you've got to find the instrument that allows you to most easily create what's in your head. So speaking of sound, you recently, well, in the last year or two, you you switched over to using the Icon bass clarinet neck and and also the bell, correct? Yeah. 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 Maybe talk a little bit about what what drew you to those and and what what difference they made as far as your sound and response and those types of things. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the the Icon equipment for a bass clarinet it's it's uh they call it red brass it's off that's often referred to as rose gold um i mean it's the same thing they're it's, they're gorgeous it's got some copper but, content also yeah yeah um it's very it, it i think it adds some color that i was looking for uh in both the bell and the neck made made my Tosca feel a little more a little more colorful that I could change things. Uh, I I didn't have that option for the 1193. I didn't have any to try. Um, they're 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 starting to show up, so now people can actually get to try them. Uh, they're I still. I think I, I ultimately, in the orchestra, when I played my Tosca, I, I sometimes was playing the silver bell and the and the icon neck because I felt that it gave slightly more power. Mm. But yeah, you know, unfortunately for the for most of the world, you're not going to get to play with the Chicago Symphony. And that's a that's that's actually a plus in this case because you don't need to generate that much sound. <laughs> I mean, if I if I played in some other orchestras, I wouldn't have have you know tried to figure out how to keep this the my concept of sound, but make it a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, I, I do want to shift gears a little bit, and that's great information about your equipment. I, I know a lot of people were interested in what you're playing on and, and, and the different equipment and, and why you choose certain things. Uh, a couple other people that are chiming in to say hello. Uh, Michael Holmes is uh, chiming in and sends his regards. He's joining us. Uh, Michael Weiss Holmes, I should say. Uh, Tiago Tavares, uh, who you answered a question from him earlier. He's actually joining us from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So we, we love having international guests joining us for these, uh, these webcasts. Also, Lynn Musco from Stetson University 
here in Florida. She is also chiming in to say hello. And uh, hello. Calvin Falwell just joined us. Hello, Calvin. Good to see hey, you. He, uh, he is uh, loving your discussion on complexity of sound. So, uh, you know, what? one thing I'd, I'd like to shift gears a little bit, and you and I uh, talked about this uh, before we got started this afternoon. You have an incredible legacy of former students that are now playing in orchestras all over North America and all over the world. Um, you uh, taught at Northwestern University for many, many years. Um, I guess I have two questions for you with that regard. Number one, um, what do you think with your teaching and with your experience playing in the CSO for all those years, uh, what do you think it was that you conveyed, the most important thing you conveyed to those students that helped them succeed as professional clarinetists and, and bass clarinetists in orchestras? Uh, around North America. And the other question is, how does that make you feel seeing all those, all those uh, wonderful musicians succeeding uh, in large part because of your influence? Well, teaching is incredibly gratifying um, in, in many ways. I mean, I, re I really miss the students because they're, they're always optimistic. Um, I, that's a, a great gift when you, when you hang out with a lot of old, older musicians. <laughs> um, I also, I was extremely fortunate to, when you teach at a school like Northwestern, you get a lot of really good student material. Uh, and, and I had the good fortune to work with a lot of very talented young people. Um, Many of which have had great success, and, and I, it, it, it's fantastic. I mean, I, you know, I love. I've, I, I've grown up. I've actually grown up and played in, in the Minnesota Orchestra with Tim, who was one of my earliest students at, at Northwestern. Tim Zabadil, uh, Yep. I've had Sam Rothstein and and Shannon Orm from Indianapolis and Detroit both come in and play with with me in Chicago. And, and it, you know, it's, it's great. It's, it's fantastic. You know, we've got a lot of service band members as well. Uh, Kevin Walko in the, in the Army Field Band at Fort Meade is, is, you know, they've gone beyond being students to not only being colleagues, but being friends. And, mm. and that's fantastic. You know, it's, uh, it, I have one, one more hope and this has all been wonderful but i want somebody that i worked with to take my place over that, that i have no say <laughs> that would be wonderful though wouldn't it 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 would mean a lot to me and i will see what happens yeah. you know they've they've heard me play for a lot of years and that that affects an audition committee you know they the the bass clarinetist uh, before John Ye and I had joined, George Weber was, was well, kind of an old curmudgeon, a very good bass clarinet player, didn't make a lot of noise. Uh, I, I heard one, one committee member said to me, I didn't know what a bass clarinet should sound like, but I thought Larry sounded pretty good, so I just listened to somebody who sounds like him. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Didn't make any sense, but it was, you know, it was not a clarinet player. I mean, that's always one of the problems in in uh, an orchestra auditioning for a bass clarinet position is there's only three other clarinetists left in the orchestra to be on the committee. Everybody else is kind of winging it because they're not sure what the heck the bass clarinet should sound like. I, I hope I've changed that in at least my own orchestra. But, that they feel like, well, that's what that's what it should sound like. Right. I'm sure there's some who say, well, we don't want anything to ever sound like that. <laughs> I doubt that. But uh, um, Jean-Francois Biscon says uh, his regards from Paris this evening. Bonjour. Well, bonsoir. Yeah, bonsoir. 
Thank you for joining us. It's, it's a pleasure to have you along with us. Thank you. Um, we appreciate everyone joining us this afternoon and, and for the questions. It's, uh, and if you have a question for Lori Bloom this afternoon, we certainly invite you to uh, put it in the comments section. We'll do our best to, uh, to get to it and uh, pose it to Lori. As you can see, he is enjoying retirement at his brand new residence in Oregon. I really wish you would ask those birds to keep it down, though. They're a little distracting to our, uh, our webcast this afternoon. <laughs> yeah. At least you're later in the day. They're not as noisy as early in the morning. Yeah, that's right. What's the temperature there, by the way? It's, it's edging up towards 70. Oh, boy. <laughs> We are, we're up in the, we're at 4,000 feet. So, I mean, we get, we get hot weather. I think it was pretty hot the day we arrived, but the rest of this week, it's been like in the seventies Been quite lovely. That's fantastic. You, you have an extra guest bedroom, right? <laughs> <laughs> it says Matt Vance over it. Yeah, oh, that's nice. I, pre I wondered if, I wondered if you'd gotten that sign in the mail yet or not. <laughs> Hey, I want to. Um, I do want to. Before we uh, before we run out of time, I had a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. Um, uh, the the Chicago Symphony Orchestra has been very. Um, it, it's obvious there's a lot of affection for you from your your orchestra colleagues, and I was uh, I was browsing some of the the posts on Facebook that they had last week uh, celebrating your retirement. And um, two of your orchestra colleagues uh, had some, some interesting uh, stories about you from their time in, in the CSO clarinet section. And I wanted, I wanted to, to see I if- I have no you, idea where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to see if, if you might be able to shed a little light on some of these stories. Um, this story comes from Steve Williamson um, and it talks about how, um, he had just joined the Chicago Symphony and there was one rehearsal for the European tour. And uh, so I guess uh, you, you had a rehearsal and then you and Steve and your wife Nan went to dinner. Um, and from what I understand, it was a, it was a very pleasant evening, but then, um, but then it, it got a little tense. Could you maybe, maybe expound on that just a little bit, please? I remember that, that well, I actually, I uh, I actually have a picture of Steve that day at his very first rehearsal with the CSO. And yeah, I had my kids with me there. They were grown at that point, but we had come out, there was a week off before the tour and we came over early when, in, for those who know the Salzburg area, if you go north and east, there's all these little lakes. And so we were hiking and swimming in lakes and having a great time. And then we came in, I joined the tour and they all went home. I mean, we all stayed in Salzburg for a few days. And that night we invited Steve to come have dinner with us. We found a lovely little outdoor place. And, and our tour photographer, who's a good friend of mine, Todd Rosenberg also showed up. And we had a great old time only time became a bit of an issue because I mean I've played in the orchestra a really long time I I don't have any long extended warm-up for most concerts and changing I've I've proven in Salzburg years ago that I can change really quickly because I had the wrong time for a concert one time and uh yeah Steve Steve likes to get there a little earlier. I mean, he's not a, a freak about it. He's not one of these guys that likes to be there an hour and a half early, but we were cutting it a little close. <laughs> and and I think it was understandable that it made him a little nervous. It was his first concert. <laughs> but, you know, he, he played great that night as he does every night. Uh, um. John Ye, your other colleague, uh, shared a, a story. I about... never heard. What's that? I never heard of him. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he, he shared a story about how um, you guys used to double a lot in the CSO. Yeah. yeah. And yep. he talked talked about Doubler's Magazine and... and uh... <laughs> 
and uh, well, I won't, I won't read that part. Um, but anyway, I'll, uh, you used to challenge yourselves to do experimental clarinet techniques <laughs> on some of the pieces. Maybe could, could you talk a little bit about, about that and in your innovation in, in. <laughs> Schulte loved to use four clarinets to do pieces that only had two clarinet parts. And uh, so we'd be playing Beethoven seven and all four of us would be there. But John and I only played when it was so loud that you couldn't hear us anyway. <laughs> so every now and then we'd call left hand day. So you'd be sitting playing and you'd go. And, and you can play the theme of Beethoven 17. Da, 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 da. It gets hard when you get to the C. <laughs> but and we got caught not not by management because they wouldn't know the difference <laughs> the i i was i was over at northwestern and the head music librarian saw me and said having a little trouble remembering which hand goes on top and John actually got a postcard. Somebody took the time to write him a postcard and said, you know, I played in bands. Like, I can't remember if it was high school or college. He said, it never occurred to me that pros get bored. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, you don't ever play like that anymore, do you? Well, we don't double anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> we got that taken care of, too. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> um, we've got a couple of more questions that have uh, come in from our viewers. And again, if you're joining us this afternoon, thank you for, for tuning in with Lori Bloom. Um, uh, Brian McDade asks, are there any new pieces recently that have drawn your interest? Well, there's a, there's, they, we don't have enough time. Yeah. What? <laughs> One of the things that I say constantly to my students and what, what I'm looking for when we would audition students at Northwestern is intellectual curiosity. I think if you're not fascinated with what's written for the instrument, what, you know, why do you want to do this? And as a clarinist, and I play enormous amounts of chamber music, if you're not if you're not interested in new music, what are you going to play? You know, you're going to play Mozart and Brahms and Weber over and over and over. But you're going to play those anyway. But I I was always fascinated by what else is out there, and so I've I've always looked, and I've been fortunate. Northwestern has a great library, but there are many great libraries. The ICA collection in Mar at the University of Maryland, you know, uh, the Australian Music Center, the Canadian Music Center. These are places where there's so much bass clarinet music that uh, it's so easy to find a piece that attracts you. And that's, that's to me, that's important. You know, no, no two people are going to pick the same piece. If, if you say, go, go get a solo bass clarinet piece and play it. I'm going to pick one thing. Andre Moisan is going to pick another one. You know, Larry, Larry Combs and I are, are very good friends. He left, there's one piece, I'm not going to name it because I don't want to insult a composer in any way. There's one piece he loved to play. I just didn't like that piece. And there's one piece that I played all the time. And he's like, I just, I, I don't like it. So that's that's good. That's what makes the world go round. And you know, we we all have to play certain things, and maybe we like them, maybe we don't. We don't we don't get a say. But when you if you're picking looking for a chamber music piece or a solo piece that you want to do, you should like it. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. We're and we're fortunate now. When I when I started in the orchestra. I thought of the bass clarinet as an orchestral instrument because there wasn't that much written for it yet. Mm. Well, now everybody's writing for it. I mean, there's enormous amounts of literature. 
you know, are they all great? That's that's in the eye of the beholder, but but grab it and try it. Uh, um, you know, speaking of uh, new music, uh, Chuck Stark is uh, tuning in this afternoon. Chuck, thanks for joining us. He has a, a comment and a question. He says uh, he loved the uh, excerpt from Ophelia's Tears that was posted on the CSO website. Is there a chance of recording of the entire piece will become available? We're actually waiting, <clears throat> excuse me, waiting to see. Um, I, I talked to Muti because our piccolo player played a contemporary concerto. Uh, our English horn player has played something. Our tuba player is supposed to solo sometime this year. I said to him, you've got a CD's worth right there. You know, and so we're waiting to see. As of this point, we, we haven't even mastered it, uh, the recording engineer and I, because they're, they're doing retro stuff during the, during the whole pandemic. Mm -hmm. So... I've heard it. It doesn't sound that bad. Oh, that's good. I'm sure. <coughs> um, we're we're getting close to the uh, to the top of the hour. Um, uh, again, those of you that are joining us this afternoon, thanks for tuning in. It's it's been a real pleasure having uh, the great Lori Bloom join us. Shifting this out of the sun. <laughs> oh, it looks good. Yeah, I noticed how you had to shift a little bit because uh, you were getting out of the shade. Oh. Wow. As I get older, this spotlight is a little... <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, I have another question for you. What, um, what's, what's next for you now that you are retired, which knowing you as I do, you're probably not going to be the typical retiree. I know you, you already had some things planned. And obviously, you're, it sounds like you're planning on going back to Chicago to, to maybe do a performance next season. What, what do you want to do in, in this, this new chapter? Well, um, woodworking is something I'm going to be doing for the next month, unpacking boxes. Uh, uh, but then... And, you, and your stuff's not there yet, right? No, it'll, it'll be here soon. Um, I, I, I hope to keep doing master classes. I, I love doing master classes and at some point schools will get back in session and, um, cause they're more fun to do live than they are over zoom. Mm. Um, I mean, as you know, when, when I do a class, I try to involve everybody, not just the one playing and, and that's hard to do over zoom. So I, I do prefer the live situation. That said, for those out there who who haven't sort of been counting, Boston has a bass clarinet opening, New York or Cleveland, depending on what Amy finally decides, because I haven't heard yet, will have an opening. The Metropolitan Opera has an opening and Chicago has an opening. Um, I, I will be giving Zoom lessons. <laughs> Um, cause I, I do know the literature, um, a little bit. yeah. And I, and I hope to, to play chamber music. Uh, I, I love chamber music has, has always been my greatest love in terms of artistic statement. And, uh, I, I, if I find people around here, great. And if I don't, I, I will find them. So. And, I, and I'm hoping, I know that there are some schools here that I, I'm most interested in working with students that, that don't have a lot of uh, support, in, you know, the kind of support most of us had in order to have success in the instrument. So I'm hoping that I can work with underprivileged kids and, you know, help, help the people that we need in the business get get a good start yeah yeah I, was, I meant to ask you earlier any performance opportunities or or uh i mean of course everything is on hold right now but uh, you know any any performance opportunities on the horizon for you locally around oregon or washington or northern california or um i 
I have been not asked to come play, but but made aware of that there's a chamber music festival about 20 miles south of here, and and Amo uh, could have could have up in Seattle said well, you got to come down and play with us, and. Uh, Juan Kak Kim at, at Eugene at the university would like me to come over and do some stuff there. We'll see. I mean, we have to see how things unload. I did. I read my wife an ad out of the Bend paper. Uh, they do have an orchestra here in Bend. No audition required. So I think I can get in. I, I, I think you probably could. <laughs> Just put on some Groucho glasses so they don't know who you are. They won't. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're just about out of time. Um, do you have any locations online that you would like people to visit as far as a website or, or anything you'd like to, to promote for our viewers? Uh, you know, I, I don't anymore. I, I had a website for years and I decided it, I wasn't utilizing it enough to, to you know, bother to maintain it. Because, I mean, the reality is that life in an orchestra is hectic. Uh, in a big orchestra, you're working so much that you're not... I found I wasn't putting enough material on a website. The website's only interesting if it's changing all the time. Um, I wasn't getting to that. The CSO website has a lot of stuff, a lot of recordings. If, if it was recorded in the last 40 years and has bass clarinet, I'm on it. Uh, and right now they have some tribute stuff and things like that, which you know, are, are fun to look at. Yeah, I think uh, my colleague Warren Coos, who is a uh, He's our high brass product specialist at Buffet Crump on USA. He's also producing today's webcast. Thank you to Warren for his help today. He just put a link to your um, CSO bio page in the comments so people can check that Thank out. You. Yeah. So a couple other people saying hello before we sign off. Jonathan Helton, who is the saxophone professor at the University of Florida. Uh, he said, uh, great to hear you talk today. Nice to see you again after so many years. So it's, it's great to make that reconnection as well. Um, when am I going to see you again? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know either. Uh, you know, I'm in that age bracket that probably shouldn't get on planes for a while. I'm getting there too, pal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it, we're all we're all in a waiting game. You know, trying to figure this out, uh, and that's unfortunate, but it's what it is. Yeah. And, and we're finding ways to use Zoom in very productive ways and things like Zoom. Uh, and I, I just taught at, at the Digital Clarinet Academy that Dixie Chen organized. I taught at week two of that. There, there's a lot of information there. Um, so I, I hope you'll link that because if people, they, they can actually see um, classes that, that any of us have taught during the week. I, th I think there's there may be fees, but you know there is a lot of material there, and uh, it was a it was a, that was a great experience. Uh, you know, not the same as being live in Jacksonville because uh, we had the same team together. That uh, that was that was great. But the uh, clarinet academy, yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. But then, well, but. Digital Clarinet Academy is a, is a good resource for people to check right now. We'll definitely put a link in for that into the comments section. Um, and just to update one, everyone about the Summer Clarinet Academy from Buffet Crump on USA, that will resume in 2021. Um, obviously, we had to kind of put things, put the brakes on and put things on hold this summer, but it will return. And uh, Lori has been an integral part of the Academy's growth well, since the beginning since uh yeah i, I thought the first couple of years yeah and 2007 then, and then was, back quite a few since yeah yeah well, we just need to have you back Lori. thank you for joining us this afternoon thank you to everyone who tuned in this afternoon um i do want to do a quick plug for our next 
Together at Home webcast. It will be a week from today, July 16th uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. I mentioned Warren Coos is our high brass product specialist. He will be your host a week from today with Hans Hoyer, French horn artist Patrick Smith. And the topic will be distance learning and more. We sincerely hope you will join us for that. Uh, for what sounds like a, a pretty universal topic, actually, not just applying to French Horn, and I think you'll have a lot of helpful information there. Again, thank you, sir, for joining us this afternoon. It's a pleasure, hey, as always. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for all who tuned in, and uh, I look forward to, to sitting across from you and, and having a beer. I, I look forward to that as well. And if you did join us late, uh, this will be archived on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find that it's Buffet Crampon Rhapsody Live is the name of the YouTube channel. Uh, the entire uh, webcast with Lori Bloom should be posted uh, probably later this afternoon or certainly by tomorrow. So please check it out. And all our webcast videos are archived is there so you can check them as well. Lori, take care. Great seeing you. My best to Nan and all your family. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Take care.